this place. And so I'm going to invite you to take your Bible out and turn to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 6 is where we're going to be at today. And when you find that, I'm going to ask you to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. I am super, super, super excited about bringing this message to you this morning. You say, why, preacher? Because I get to preach, and that's what I live for. And so I'm just excited to be able to preach. Mark chapter 6, starting in verse number 7. And we'll read through verse 13, pray and ask God to help us understand it. Here's what the scripture says. And he called the twelve to himself. And he began to send them out two by two. And he gave them power over unclean spirits. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except staff. No bag, no bread, no copper in their money belts. But to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. Also he said to them, in whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place. And whoever will not receive you nor hear you, when you depart from there, shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. That's pretty bad, folks. So they went out and preached that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Let's pray. Father... I just pray in the mighty name of Jesus today, God, that uh, our hearts would be bent towards you. God, we can't bend them towards you without the Spirit of the living God. And so I pray that you would allow your Spirit to take control of us today and point our minds and our hearts and everything that's within us toward Jesus. God, I pray that as we dive into your word and we dive into this passage of Scripture that we would not just be listening to some stories, but we would be listening to the voice of you speaking to us. And God, I pray that you would help us to be quick to obey whatever it is that you quicken within our heart to do. God, today we ask you to exalt the name of Jesus through everything that happens in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now, I want to educate some of you this morning. Um, Not very many of you, but some of you this morning, particularly you young people, I want to take you on a journey all the way back to 1986. Way long time ago. 1986. One of the most popular movies of the year was a movie by the name of Top Gun. Anybody remember Top Gun? Amen. And in that particular, do y'all remember Top Gun? Any of you young people? Amen. I'm not, Amanda, you're not young. You're, you're, you do remember Top Gun though. Okay, well good. Edit that out. I called Mandy not young. <laughs> in Top Gun, the movie was about the main two characters, uh, two guys by the name of Maverick and Goose, and they were Navy pilots, and they had earned the right to be a part of this prestigious uh, Naval Academy called Top Gun, to where every day they would fly, and they would compete for points. And every day that you won a battle, you would receive so many points. And so they were out there one day, and they were doing their deal out there up in the sky, and they were having these fake fights with all these other guys that were on the, on the Top Gun level. And uh, one day, Maverick and Goose were kind of celebrating, and all of a sudden, I don't know, something to do with the wind came up, and it kind of messed up their plane. And so they started twisting around, and they were doing all kinds of stuff, and it got real dangerous, and they had to eject out of the plane. And when they ejected out of the plane, Goose, which was Maverick's wingman, he flies up into the canopy, and he breaks his neck, and he ends up dying. I mean, it's a sad story. He ends up dying, and Maverick, the pilot, he was very upset about it, and he was distraught about it, and he had to talk with the family, and he was just upset, didn't know if he's going to be able to fly, and finally they put him back up in the sky to let him fly, and he had a new partner, and it came about to where they were uh, right up on somebody else's tail, and they were getting ready to pull the trigger and getting ready to shoot them. Now, this is all fake, but they're getting ready to shoot them, and he wouldn't pull the trigger. And so his, ma- the, 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 his wingman behind him was saying, Maverick, you can engage now. Engage, Maverick. Engage. And he just wouldn't do it. It's not clear. It's not clear. It's not clear. I, I could, it should be Maverick, right? He's like, it's not clear. It's not clear. It's not good. It's not good. And he's like, anytime you can engage, you can engage. And long story short, he never engaged. And then they ended up getting shot. And so therefore they lost points instead of gaining points. And they're all trying to get these points. And all of that took place because, are you listening to me? It took place, nobody, that's great, awesome. It took place because he did not engage in the battle. Now listen carefully. You and I got to understand this. We are in a battle. We are in a battle. I mean, every single day 
We are in a battle. But listen to this. A battle without engagement is a battle that will never be won. You will never win the battle if you don't engage in the battle. And every day of our lives, there is a battle that is going on for the souls of men, women, and boys and girls. People you know, and people I know, people we love, and people we care about. There is a battle that is going on. Young people, your friends, maybe even your brothers and your sisters and your aunts and your uncles and your siblings and everybody that we know, there is a literal battle that is going on for their souls. And their very soul may depend upon you engaging in the battle. The question is, are you going to engage? Are you going to be a spectator in the war? Or are you going to be someone who engages in the battle? Now in this passage of Scripture, Jesus is going to give us some ideas of what it looks like when we engage in the battle. So I want to show you a few things from this passage of Scripture this morning about engaging in this battle for the souls of men. One, you need to understand this. You are empowered by the Lord Jesus Christ. You are empowered by the Lord Jesus. Look what he says in verse number 7. He called the twelve to himself, and he began to send them out two by two. Why did he send them out two by two? Because that's better than one by one. It's always good to have a partner in crime, amen? Goose, Goose was Maverick's wingman. It's always good to have a partner in crime, and I mean in crime in a good way, right? All you police officers. It's always good to go out two by two. And so he sent them out two by two, and watch this. It says, and he gave them power over unclean spirits. That's an interesting word because the, pow the word power there means authority. It means permission. And so Jesus is giving them permission or authority or power. It comes from the Greek word that means to deny the presence of a hindrance. So in other words, Jesus is giving them the authority to be able to go out and do what he wants them to do without any hindrance whatsoever. Listen to this. In other words, Jesus gives you power. If you will walk in it, he will use that power to do great things and nothing will hinder the work of his power because his power is authority and it reigns supreme. Amen. Can I get a witness on that this morning in the house that God's authority is absolutely supreme and there is nothing that can stand against his authority? And he gives that authority to us. And that's what it teaches us in this passage. Jesus gives them his authority. Well, what kind of authority does Jesus have? Well, the Bible says in Matthew 28, 18, and 20, which we know is the Great Commission, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What is that? That is an invitation to be empowered by the power of Jesus in order to do what? To engage people with the gospel. That's what it is. See, the Great Commission is our invitation to receive power from God to engage people with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we should be doing, amen? Man, what's wrong with you people this morning? We are engaged people with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, watch this, you know that thing that saved your wretched soul from hell? That thing, yeah, that'll get you a little bit more motivated, huh? Oh, wait, great, I don't have to go to hell. There are other people out there who need that message of the gospel. And Jesus has given us the invitation to engage people with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You just have to learn to walk in the power that the gospel gives you. You have to learn to walk in the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And guess what that means? That means you have to start believing that you are empowered by your faith in Jesus. See, there are so many people that's under the sound of my voice right now. You've been saved by the grace and mercy of God, and you are filled with the Spirit of the living God, and you still don't think you've got any power to do what Jesus is calling you to do. You're still sitting on the sidelines, unengaged in the battle, because you don't think you've got the power to do so, and yet the Bible says that we've been empowered by the Spirit of the living God. Wonder what a church would look like that is absolutely filled with the power of the Spirit of God and the people actually believe that they are filled with the power of the Spirit of God and they go out and engage a lost and dying world. I guarantee you we'd have to build again. No, we wouldn't. We'd just go to two services. Amen. I guarantee you that's what would happen. 
You have to start believing that you're filled with the Spirit which enables you to walk in power. You have to understand and walk in your identity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me tell you something. I want you to listen to this. Y'all with me this morning? There's a lot of stinking naysayers in this world. There's a lot of negative people in this world, son. I'm going to go on back here a little bit so y'all won't feel left out. There's a lot of negative people in this world that'll fill your mind with a bunch of garbage that, are, that the devil will use to keep you from being who God wants you to be. And if you're not careful, you'll buy into that garbage. Hello, somebody. I, I was, let, me, let me tell you something. I, this past week, I was going through a little spiritual warfare. Y'all do believe in spiritual warfare, don't you? Okay, going through a little spiritual warfare. And uh, it was, I, was, I, was que- I was questioning stuff. Quest- negativity creeps in. You begin to question everything. Am I doing this right? Are we doing this right? Are we doing- Lord, was that you? Let me make sure that you. And you start questioning all this stuff. And some precious saints from this church. Now, I asked some folks to pray for me. But some precious saints of this church. Now, watch this. Not what you would call... Listen, not what you would say, oh, well, they're, they're, they've got positions at the church. That's why. No, 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 not those people. But at the right time when I needed some confirmation, God put it on the heart of some of the precious people in this church to text me what God was doing in their life. Not solicited. I didn't ask for it. I just talked to Jesus about it and got some prayer warriors on it, Right? So then I get some text messages from some people telling me what God is doing in their life and how God is blessing. And guess what? It was, it, God used those people, unimportant people now. You know what I mean when I say that? Not like it was Brother Gary who we paid. He didn't send me an encouraging text. Well, they paid me up here. I better encourage the preacher. It was someone else in the congregation. Unimportant people. Send me a text and watch this. Gave me confirmation against the negativity that I was hearing. Does that make sense? Confirmation. Guess what that did? Let's go. Press forward. Press forward. Let's go. You say, preacher, why do you share that story? Well, listen to this. Because all of a sudden I had a crisis of identity. I was questioning myself. Questioning myself because of negativity. And I needed God to remind me who I am in Jesus and that we're headed in the right direction, and so on and so forth. Does that make sense to anybody in this room? You say, preacher, what does that mean for the rest of us? Watch this. That's why the body's important. Three non-important people sending the preacher a text about what God's doing in their life, reminded the preacher, press forward. Amen? Hey, look at me. I need you to do what God tells you to do. Amen? You need me to do what God says. But it all starts with us believing in our identity. It's believing that you are the redeemed of God. I'm the redeemed of God. Amen. That's why I, that's why I worship like I do. I feel good about it. Amen. I do. I feel good about it. You're not going to stop my worship. I want to worship the Lord because I'm the redeemed of God. I believe that with every fiber of my being. I'm an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ. I get to speak on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. I get to open up the bread of life and share with people about Jesus, man. I am an ambassador of Jesus Christ. I'm pretty excited about it, too, if you can't tell. But you got to believe in yourself. you got to understand that you are empowered by the Lord Jesus Christ. Second thing I see in this passage of Scripture, not only should you recognize that as you engage the battle, you are empowered by the Lord Jesus, but you need to be dependent upon Jesus, too. And he depended upon Jesus. Verse number 8, look what it says. And he commands them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bag, no bread, no copper in the money belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. When you look at that, Jesus tells the men to engage the world, but go without their normal necessities. No bag with anything in it, no bread, no money, and only one tunic. Only one coat, all right? If it gets real cold, just snuggle. I mean, just only one coat. So you look at that passage and you go, why would Jesus do that? Why would Jesus say, I'm going to send y'all out, man, like sheep among wolves. I'm going to send you out there, but I ain't going to send you with anything. Why do he do it? Here's why. I believe that Jesus sent them out with nothing in order to teach them to trust him for what they need. To just put all of their faith and all of their trust in him for what they need. Think about it. Now this one right here will strike 
this will strike deep into your heart because we believe in giving because Jesus teaches giving, right? So we believe in giving, we believe in tithing, we believe in offerings and things of that nature. So we do that, but at the same time, we can't let that get in the way of trusting Jesus. So watch this. This is a statement. This convicted the fire out of me. Are we really trusting God if we don't need God? Are you really trusting him if you don't need him? Think about that for just a second. I remember years ago, and you, many of you heard this story, but those of you who haven't heard it, I want to tell it, and those of you who have heard it, you don't remember it anyway because I'm not that good of a preacher. But anyway, uh, years ago, I decided, a long time ago, I decided that, that God spoke to my heart about going to seminary. So I went to seminary for a little while, and while I was doing that, some churches that I was pastoring or youth pastor at, they were chipping in, paying for my school, paying for my school. Well, then I went into evangelism, and instead of just continuing my school, trusting God to take care of it, I, I kind of stayed out. I said, well, I don't have the money because I'm in evangelism, and I'm like, need all this money to eat, you know? And so I stayed out for a little while, and then finally, after about two years of staying out, the Lord chastised me about it and said, you remember, I encouraged you to go to seminary and finish seminary, and I would take care of that, and here you are, you're laying out. So, I, I mean, I need, if you're going to be obedient to me, I need you to go back and do what you said you was going to do a long time ago. Right? Some of y'all are still waiting on God to give you something else to do, but you ain't done the last thing he told you to do. Why would he give you something else if you hadn't done the last thing? So I'm sitting there going, okay, Lord. So I call the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, and I start trying to register. And, of course, you know, they got to get shot records and all this kind of stuff. And I guess the Lord has my shot records. I don't know where those things went. And I couldn't find them. And I said, this is too much trouble. So I just called Liberty University. And I said, hey, I want to register for school. Do y'all need shot records and all that? And they said, no, we don't need all that. Uh, you could sign up right here over the phone. I said, praise God. So I signed up for some internet classes, and the lady said to me, this is the truth. The lady said to me, she said, sir, how are you going to pay for it? And I said, this, God is my witness. I said, God's going to pay for it. She chuckled. This is a Christian university. She chuckled. She goes, ha, ha, so you mean you're going to pay out of pocket? And I said, yes, ma'am, I'm going to pay out of pocket. Now, I'm going to just tell you right now, my pocket, about like they are right now, I had some peppermints probably. I didn't have no money. I was just trusting God, put it on my heart to go. So uh, about a week later, I, I hadn't told, you know, my buddies about, you know, I didn't go around in my inner circle or anything saying, hey, you signed up for school. I ain't got the money to pay for it. Uh, I didn't do any of that. You know, I just signed up, said God's going to take care of it. I believe he put it on my heart. I had a need. Well, about a week later, a buddy of mine walks up to my house, and he said, Preacher, he said, me, uh, my wife and I, we want to really support y'all's ministry, and we you know, want to invest in y'all's ministry and stuff. And so he hands me a check. Well, I mean, you know, you don't look at it while they're they sitting right there. So I said, Brother, I said, I appreciate it. I thank God for you and your, and your wife and your family, and I, I, I'll be a good steward of this that you give me. I'll just, but I walked in the house after he leaves. I opened it up. Watch this. No joke. $14,000. I said, hey, man, praise God. That's, that's what I said. Oh, my glory. Actually, actually, I called him. No, I texted him because the call would have been awkward. So I texted him, and I said, did you put too many zeros on that check? That's the truth. I asked him that. He said, no, no, I didn't. That's what it was supposed to be. And I was like, brother, thank you. And I just blabbered all over myself and everything. He said, preacher, why do you share that story? Just God meeting a need. God meeting a need. Doing what God told me to do. I didn't have it. God met the need. Amen. I mean, it's just glory. You say, preacher, he don't do that for everybody. Oh, yeah, he does. It's just most people don't try him. Right? <laughs> Listen to this. If you choose to engage your friends and this world with the gospel, there will be times when you just are not going to have the words, you're not going to have the strength, you're not going to have the desire or the resources to do what you think you need to do, but trust me, God will provide if God leads you to do it. Amen? So God was going to provide for these men because God is the one who sent them out. Listen to this passage. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. This passage of Scripture comes on the heels of several verses that remind us that God takes care of the birds of the field. And if God takes care of the birds of the field, how much more will He take care of us? The problem is we're not seeking His righteousness and His kingdom. Amen? <laughs> That's the truth. Shame on me. 
Shame on me. See, he provided enough to feed 5,000 people with just a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. Wow. What a provider. This is one of my all-time favorites. He sent ravens to feed the prophet Elijah bread and meat every morning. Can you imagine that? You're sitting out there by that brook that he sent you to, and the brook was there for your water, and every morning, ah, ah, there he comes, whatever a raven sounds like. You look up there, and that brother got some, he got, look, he got a steak ribeye, no, prime rib, seasoned and seared with cat head biscuits. Ah, ah, ah. He, what you do, you make way. <laughs> Get up right there, landing strip right there. Every morning and every evening, God did that for Elijah. Now, I'm going to tell you, listen to me. Here, what you've got to understand is God's got ravens today too. And he'll take care of his people, amen. He'll provide for his people. We just got to trust him. I love how he also supernaturally transported Philip from one place to another, supernaturally to be an interpreter for an Ethiopian eunuch in order for him to get saved. Got a man down there, Philip, needs to hear the gospel through the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah. I'm just going to take you from here and put you down there supernaturally so that you can let him know what all that's about. He provided for the man's salvation. He provided an angel to break Peter out of jail so he could continue preaching the gospel. I love that story too. Hey, here's what I love. The church was praying for it. And it happened. He went to the house, knocking on the house where they was praying. They opened the door and said, oh, there's a ghost out there. It looks like Peter. But well, we know it can't be him because he's in jail. Isn't that like us? Oh, dear God, I'm asking you to meet this need and pray all this stuff. And it comes in the mail and you go, that can't be right. That can't be right. Amen. We question it. But listen to this. God will provide you with all you need to accomplish his will. All you need to do is depend upon him. But watch this. This is a good word. The moment you begin to depend on you, is the moment that the devil will begin to provide you with every excuse you need to turn away from the will of God. The moment you start looking within your power is the moment the devil goes, good, now I can give them all those excuses like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to say. I don't know what I, I can't afford it. I'm not going to have a, that's exactly where the devil wants us to be, depending upon us. Remember the, the spies that went over into the land that God had promised them? Remember that? Those 12 spies went over there and it was just like God said it was going to be. And they were like, man, you see them pomegranates? Man, them things are big. Look at them grapes. They're huge. Oh, my word. Did you see them giants? We can't beat them giants. They're too big. Too many of them. So they come back, and 10 out of the 12 said, negative Nancy's. 10 out of the 12 said, we can't, we can't, we can't beat them giants. I mean, yeah, it's just like God said. It's milk and honey flour. I mean, it's awesome over there, man. I'm telling you, it's a good place. But there's big people over there. And we cannot fight against those big people. They will squash us. And two spies, only two spies, think about that. Only two spies said, oh, yes, we can. Oh, yes, we can. God has given us that land. I love the, I love the energy and the enthusiasm of Joshua and Caleb as they come back and said, those giants are like bread to us, son. We'll eat them alive. Amen. That's our land. God gave it to us. And the ten negative Nancys. Causing people to wander around in the wilderness for 40 years. Let me ask you, are you one of them negative Nancy's going to hold this church back? Are you one of them negative Nancy's that's so negative about everything that takes place and goes on, we can't move forward because you're holding us back in the wilderness? Tell you what we need. We need a church full of people that says, let's go. They're like bread to us. People that trust God for what God has for us. Number three, you got to remember as they had to remember, they were representing Jesus when they went out, and Jesus was representing them. And I'll move quickly. If God sends you out as he has, if you are a believer, then you are a representative of Jesus, and everywhere you go, listen, everywhere you go, whether someone else that knows you is there or not, everywhere you go, you should exalt Jesus because Jesus has blessed you as a servant of his. He sent them out. He said, every town you go to, go to the house and stay there. And if they don't welcome you, then leave that place. Shake the dust off your feet. They will be condemned. Listen to this. Being a representative of Jesus doesn't mean everyone automatically accepts you. So Jesus is preparing these men for rejection. 
He reveals to them that some will accept them and be blessed, but others will reject them and receive judgment. But listen to this. Pay attention. Don't be discouraged when they reject you. John chapter 15 verse 20 says, The servant is no greater than the master. If they rejected Jesus, they will reject you as well. We have to understand that. Not everybody is going to accept us in the name of Jesus. Some people will reject us in the name of Jesus. But listen, the reality is that their rejection of you is not really anything more than a rejection of Jesus and His gospel. Does that make sense? Choir, does that make sense? Amen, that makes sense. It's not rejecting you, it's rejecting Jesus. Crazy. The very person they swear they're trying to follow, they're rejecting. And they're not condemned because they have rejected you. They are condemned because they have rejected their only hope. And that's Jesus. See, people aren't condemned because they reject you, young people, because they say you're an a, a uncool Jesus follower. They don't, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting the Jesus that you serve, who sent you out. And so they're condemned because of that reason. They've rejected their only hope. Remember this. God never gives us power to save people. We, don't, we can't save people. I can't save people. If I did, everybody in this room today that's not saved would get saved during this invitation in a few minutes. There's no doubt about it. But I can't save people. He didn't give me the power to do that. He gives us the power to share the gospel, which is the power of God into salvation, according to Romans chapter 1, verse 16. So we are just to share the gospel. Listen to this, though. Rejection is a part of the battle for the souls of men, but so is acceptance. There are times whenever you will engage a lost friend, and they will reject you. But there are times whenever you engage a lost friend, they will receive what you have to say. They will repent of their sins. They will put their faith and their trust in the Lord Jesus. There are times when I give an invitation and nobody will move. But there are times when I give an invitation and God begins to move on the hearts of people and they will come down and say, I want to get saved and follow Jesus. See, rejection is a part of it, but so is acceptance. Some people will believe. And so we continue to do the work knowing that we are representing Jesus and Jesus is representing us. Last thing, you have to remember that as you engage the world, you are a part of the work of the Lord Jesus. Now this is the cool part to me. These men were obedient to engaged, the demon possessed, verse 12 and 13, so they went out, preached the people should repent, and they cast out many demons, anointed with oil, those who were sick, and they healed them. So they were given, uh, they were given the opportunity and the power to engage the demon-possessed, the sick, and the lost. And what happens? Demons flee, and people were healed. Now, I believe that people were healed of their physical diseases, and they were healed of their spiritual de disease. I believe that people gave their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why did all this happen? All this happened because they engaged people with the gospel. They engage people with the gospel of Jesus. I, um, I, I received, a, uh, I received a, a text from, I hope, where's Miss Luann? Well, I hope it's all right if I share that. Is it okay if I just share the gist of that text? You sure? Okay. I, I received a text from Miss Luann Lou um, this week. And uh, she, she, she was telling me, she, there were some things in there I'm not going to share with you, but there were some things in there that I want to share with you. And one of the things that I want to share with you is that she was in the Hobby Lobby. All right? She was in the Hobby Lobby, I guess, buying some crafts. And guess what? Shared the gospel with a lady, and a lady got saved at the Hobby Lobby. But the, the, those people that own the store are Christian people. She's in there, shares the gospel. Somebody gives their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why on earth did that happen? Because she engaged someone with the gospel. Now, it's very possible that Miss Luann has shared the gospel with people before. I mean, I know before she led somebody to the Lord in the post office. But I guarantee you can ask her, and there'll be times where she say, I shared the gospel with somebody, and they rejected it. Right? Amen? Rejected it. But if you keep engaging the world with the gospel of Jesus, there are going to be times when folks are going to accept it, and you remember then, you just remember then how much you are a part of the word of God. Listen to this. This is so good. Look at your neighbor and say, this is about to be really good. Look at him right now and tell him that. This is about to be good. Great statement. Listen to this. How will you know who the gospel will save if you save the gospel? Amen. That's a, I'm telling you, that's a... A mouthful. How will you know who the gospel will save if you save the gospel? Now, some of y'all still ain't checked. You know, I don't know what he's talking about. Okay, here's the gospel. 
The gospel has power to save you people. But I say, I'm saving that for myself. And I never give it to you. How will I know if it'll save any of y'all? But what we do is we sit around and go, well, I don't know. Church ain't growing. Ain't nobody. I don't know. you saving the gospel. Waiting on other people to do it. How do we know who the gospel will save if we save the gospel? Think about it. Think about this. What would it be like if you shared, shared the gospel with somebody during this invitation today? If you shared the gospel with somebody during the invitation today, somebody that you feel like doesn't have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. What, what it, listen, young people, what if one of your best friends were in this room today and your loved one was in this room today and their eternity is hanging on the balance and God wants you to share the gospel with them today? Today, not, not, he wants you to share it today. What would you do? What will you do? What would it be like in this church if every time we gather together, people are sharing the gospel with other people that they are concerned about? Now, if they share the gospel with you, it ain't because they hate you. It's because they love you. And they want you to be saved, right? If you're not. So listen to this. This is my closing effort here. Your effort to engage your friends in this world with the gospel is dependent upon your friendship with the gospel. Your effort to engage this world with the gospel, it's dependent upon your friendship with the gospel. You say, what do you mean, preacher? Well, let me just ask you a question. How well are you acquainted with the gospel? Has the gospel ever saved you? See, because if the gospel's never saved you and you've never trusted in the gospel, you can make certain you're not going to share it with other people because it hasn't made a difference in your life. And so this morning, the reality is this, and I'm not trying to jump all in your business and all in your Kool-Aid, but I want you to listen to me. The reality is some of you are genuinely born again of the Spirit of the living God. You've got salvation. Can't nobody take it away from you. I mean, you are living for Jesus. You are, I'm telling you, son, you are on fire for the Lord. You're ready to fight hell with a water pistol. You're so excited about Jesus. And then there's some of you, you're not concerned about the gospel at all because the gospel's never gotten you. And today is a great day for you to come to the realization that you need the gospel. You need Jesus to set you free of your sin so that you would begin to follow Him, walk with Him, be concerned about His things, be concerned about His kids, be concerned about this world, and begin to share the gospel with everybody else. Young people, listen to me now. Now, I want to make sure we're clear about this because we live in a world that, we live in a world that confuses everything. Everything. Here's what you've got to understand. Your attendance at this church does not make you a Christian. It doesn't. It doesn't. What makes you a Christian is when God supernaturally opens your eyes and draws you toward Jesus, man. And you realize Jesus is the only way. He's the only hope you got. And you say, you know what I want to do? I want to put my faith and trust in Jesus and follow after Him. Now, now listen, young people, we're going to look this way because I'm talking to y'all too. I'm going to put my faith and my trust in Jesus and Him alone for salvation, turning from my sins, giving my whole life to Him. I'm not holding anything back. I'm like, any sin I got that's in my life, I want God to forgive me of it, and I'm turning away from it. I'm trusting Jesus to save me of my sin. There's some people in this room that need to do that. But here's what I know. God didn't give me the power to save you. He gave me the power to share with you the gospel, Jesus, that saves you. It's up to you to be saved or not. Amen? So this morning, I'm just going to simply ask you, what is it in your life that needs to happen? What did God say to you during the message? Just respond to how God leads you to respond, not the preacher. Does that make sense?